have the wonderful privilege this day to have coming along and talking to you, Pastor Kyle Ray. Pastor Kyle, he is the lead pastor at Saint Church in Plano, Texas. And Pastor Kyle, this is the way you describe yourself. I love Jesus. I like to talk. What a privilege to <laughs> preach the gospel regularly. That's right. And in fact, I just heard you in chapel right now. And, uh, you, yeah. I, and what I wrote down in my notebook was, this guy is so eloquent <laughs> oh, for Jesus you. Christ. Now, an interesting fact before I actually begin asking you some questions is this. You ran a comrades race in South Africa, which is basically around a 50 mile race. Now, the reason I know about that, because I ran it when I was a missionary over there. This is my question for you. Why would you decide to run a race like that? Well, Jim, I did that in conjunction with World Vision. I was trying to get children sponsored uh, in other parts of the world. So the goal was to get a child sponsor for every mile of that race. And at that point, World Vision had talked me into running marathons and other endurance events. So the next step was, hey, would you consider doing a Comrades Marathon? So yeah, it was the uphill year. As you know, there's an uphill and a downhill. And we got a lot of children sponsored on that trip. So Well, I've run it. I thought I would never do it again. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think so many people finish it and say, I'll never do that again. Yeah. And then they sign up again. Next time, that's right. Yeah, very good. Well, that was great that you did that. Thank great you. accomplishment. Thank you. So, the church you're at right now, Sin Church, sees her purpose in the following way, helping people discover where Jesus is sending them. Powerful. Now, I noticed, though, that as I was looking at the website there, that Scent is hosting a two-day event calling all entrepreneurs and small business owners to engage in special workshops. Mm -hmm. When I saw that, I kind of scratched my head a little bit and saying that is not a typical thing that a church does. <laughs> right. Could you explain a little bit about these workshops, yeah. why you're doing it? There's a couple streams. Number one, I just looked up and got curious. It seemed like God was drawing a lot of entrepreneurs to our church. And as I would talk to them, they would say things like, we love the clarity of your vision. And our vision is clear enough to where people can decide, am I on board with it or am I not on board with it? We said we want to launch a disciple making movement that leads to the planting of at least 15 multi-ethnic congregations by 2035. So I was just intrigued. So I got these entrepreneurs together for dinner and they started talking about in an era of downsizing and side hustles and solopreneur stuff, maybe one way we could serve the community if folks have been downsized and don't know what to do next is to equip them to start their own businesses. We happen to have a couple of venture capitalists that God has drawn to our congregation that are passionate about teaching entrepreneurship. And so it's really just an expression of how can we best serve what seems to be a growing need in the community in a day of downsizing and non-traditional education. The other thing is one of those venture capitalists kind of reminds me of Lydia in the New Testament. Lydia in Acts 16, we're told she was a follower. She was a believer in God, but she hadn't yet opened her heart to the message of the gospel. And she was a businesswoman, a dealer in purple cloth. And then Paul comes along and she surrenders and her whole household gets baptized. So one of my venture capitalists that's there passionate about entrepreneurship, believer in God, but really working things out in terms of any kind of relationship with Christ. And so it's been cool to walk alongside her to see her using her gifts to help people learn entrepreneurship while I'm teaching her about the gospel. Well, it seems to me as if Send Church is willing to try some really creative things as a means of getting the message out. Yeah. Could you talk to us a little bit more? What are some other things you're doing to reach your community? Sure. And let me just say one more thing about the, the called event, Unlocking Entrepreneurship. It's interesting that the same bias for action and startup energy that's needed to plant a church is what entrepreneurs often need when they want to start their businesses. So I think there's some common threads there in terms of the people God has drawn. As far as other things we do, we do a monthly uh, what we call a scent serving day. So like a lot of congregations, we're trying to figure out how to mobilize the congregation to serve. We recently did something called Feed the Firehouse Family, where we had volunteers come, prepare meals. We delivered them to all of the 11 fire stations in Plano. And we left a note just encouraging them. This is a gift from Scent Church. But then I started to hear feedback from some of the firefighters that they would you know, come in for their shift. You know, oftentimes there's a really tight-knit community and they love food. And so to see that note, like what kind of church would deliver us a meal? Um, we've walked alongside the human trafficking organization in town, the organization that helps people consider pregnancy options, the Pregnancy Resource Center in our area. Uh, there's a great organization that walks alongside the homeless in downtown Dallas where we've gone and served. Um, so those are some of the ways that we just try and get plugged in the community. And then we've adopted a school nearby where we're trying to raise up mentors. We try and provide food for those children on free and reduced lunch that don't have food to eat on the weekends. 
but we're constantly trying to figure out how to best love on the community around us. That's exciting to hear, very exciting. I just had the wonderful joy of listening to you speak in chapel, and it was so, so good. You basically took the, the passage of scripture, Revelation 19, verse six to nine, and you were talking about the wedding of the Lamb of God. I really would like for you to share with the group here. In fact, I actually put it, I was writing on Facebook, okay. listening, and people were writing me saying, what are the key points that he's talking oh, about? Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. And so if you yeah. wouldn't mind sharing, what sure. were the key points you were talking yeah, about? Yeah, so my two key points are, one, Christ followers are invited to a wedding. So, you know, it's interesting. When you normally get a wedding invitation, you get the date, the time, the location. Well, Scripture says no one knows the day or the hour. But when, when it comes, there's going to be a dress code. We're going to get the right clothes to wear based on the righteous acts that we've done. And so Christ followers are invited to this wedding. And then second, the church should be a foretaste. The local church, chapel expressions, it should provide a, a foretaste or a glimpse of what that wedding supper of the Lamb is going to be like. And the overarching idea of all of it is the church is the bride of Christ being prepared for this wedding. We never go to an earthly wedding and criticize the bride as the bride is coming down the aisle, but we've grown far too comfortable throwing lots of criticism at the bride of Christ. And some of that is because people have been hurt. Some of that is because of bitterness. But I think sometimes we're even more critical about the bride than the bridegroom is. I think we can throw, there's, there's nothing wrong with healthy critique. But I think people have gotten too comfortable throwing rocks at the church, especially from within the church. So, How does your church then help individuals that have been hurt by the church and actually getting them to come to church? Yeah. So we talk a lot about the power of community. I remember hearing from counselors, this goes back to like Larry Crabb days, talking about if you start to weigh the effectiveness of a licensed counselor versus healthy Christian community, Oftentimes, healthy community where there's people in the Word trying to listen to the Holy Spirit, there's accountability, and there's prayer for one another, and it's regularly gathering, oftentimes that will be more effective than a visit with a life, licensed counselor if the community is healthy. So what we talk a lot about is living scent. If you're in healthy community, that becomes attractive to people. A lot of times when people have been hurt by the church, it's because of some kind of spiritual abuse, some kind of power dynamic that's been you know, overutilized or overexpressed. But when they see authenticity, when they see authentic community, it becomes attractive. And that's one of the ways we invite people to come into the life of the church. We say, you know what? You might, you might be more drawn to the community of people you see gathering, like in a smaller setting, than you are to our weekend services at first. And that's fine. We'd love to be that church where we have more people in our groups than we have in our weekend services. That's great. I was going to make you a comment. I'm sitting in a balcony looking down at the students. We knew you were an eloquent speaker. But then when you began singing <laughs> the song. Oh, butterfly kisses. Yeah, I'm watching all the students. They're actually leaning oh, forward. Wow. It's like, what a great voice you <laughs> Thank have. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. that. Wow. When you were talking about Revelation 19, you were also then connecting it to developing multi-ethnic churches. Yeah. So we're told in Revelation what that multitude is going to look like. So in Revelation 19, we're told what the multitude is saying. There's this rejoice and be glad and give him glory. But earlier in Revelation, we're given a description of this multitude. That it's going to be every tribe, nation, language, and tongue, right? It's going to be diverse, this variety of people from all over the world. And so for me, I, when I say the church should be a foretaste of that wedding banquet, I just think in a lot of communities, there's this diverse group of people that are living in those communities. And sometimes the church is more segregated than the surrounding community is. We just have a passion to see that not be the case. We really value healthy multi-ethnic community. But the reality though is that when I was being trained, I was taught that the homogeneous church idea really was the faster way of getting churches. Yes, that homogeneous unit principle. So we talk a lot about that was never intended to be a strategy for church growth. It was really intended to sometimes create some islands of familiarity in a sea of diversity. I tell people sometimes, like particularly when African Americans come into a predominantly white church that's transitioned to be multi-ethnic, sometimes they may need a starting point where they're in community with other African Americans, but that's never intended to be the stopping point. That might be an, an orienting kind of vehicle. Same for other ethnic groups as well. 
the homogeneous unit principle has some value, but it wasn't supposed to be used as a strategy for church planting. So in a practical way, what is your church doing as a means of making a church that is multicultural, multi-ethnic? Yeah. So we always think about our staffing. Do we have a staff that reflects diversity? So often a church will say, we're passionate about multi-ethnic ministry. And then you go look at their website and it's mono-ethnic. We think about the songs that we sing and the languages that we sing them in and the pictures that we put on the wall. You know, growing up, it was not uncommon to see a picture of white Jesus in a black church. And yet we all know across the board that white Jesus is culturally inaccurate. And so you can either stop using pictures of Jesus because we can't really depict them, which we, we do. We don't, we don't have pictures of Jesus on the wall. We're, we're fine with having a cross on the wall. Um, we think about uh, when we market an event, do we have resources in different languages? And we have room to grow on this, but even like our, we have an immigrant connection center in the life of our church, and we make sure that there's multi-ethnic uh, resources so that when people are out there encountering people that need immigration help, that they can actually read the document. Even something as simple as if we have food at an event, there's a huge Indian population around us. We think, do we have vegetarian options? Sometimes we've had samosas come in from the local Indian restaurant because it's an outreach event and we know that we're going to have some vegetarians around us. So just trying to be intentional, that's the key word I tell people over and over again, intentionality. Intentionality about what we preach, about who's on the stage, about what we sing, all of it. I know that the district that I'm a part of, they really wanted to really wanting our pastors to really consider moving into more of a multicultural mindset. But the reality is that you and I realize it doesn't happen overnight. Right. What are some of the challenges that our pastors need to be kind of watching out for as they're moving into? Yeah, so some people would say it's a 20 year journey, which may sound daunting. They say you can accelerate that journey if you change a leader. <laughs> Right, so sometimes a, a leader change, a more uh, a diverse leader comes in that's different than the the norm, and that might be accelerated. But I would say what leaders have to watch out for is people see diversity as a diversity issue, and in reality, it's a discipleship issue. And so there are so many places in Scripture where you see that as discipleship was taking place, and as people listened to the Holy Spirit, and as they crossed cultural lines, there was explosive growth in the gospel. So I think that people accuse pastors that start to get passionate about multi-ethnic ministry of being woke or liberal in their theology, and yet there's so much support in scripture to point people to. So I think pastors just need to stay rooted in the word. Remember, this is about discipleship, not about diversity. And I think a key you just shared, it could be long-term. Yeah, it has to be long-term. And if it's just about diversity, when it's long-term, there'll be diversity fatigue. But if it's about discipleship, well, that's what Jesus said, go and do, make disciples. And Jesus himself crossed cultural lines. So I'm often intrigued by Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus made the Samaritan the hero in the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus was the one that made note that when the lepers were healed, the one that came back happened to be a Samaritan <laughs> that got healed. You know, like, why did Jesus make such a big deal? Because he was modeling what we ought to do. It's just cross cultural lines. Wow, very good. I have one last question I would like to ask you, and it's really kind of more of a personal question. That one of the things that I find when I'm out speaking at different churches, we begin talking about what is leadership. Mm. And the reality is that I think our pastors, many times they hear that phrase, biblical leadership, but they're not really sure. What does that actually mean? Yeah. So when I think of biblical leadership, I think of leadership that's led by the Holy Spirit. It's got to start with listening to the voice of God. You know, in just a secular sense, yeah, leadership is about casting a compelling vision, aligning the resources, and motivating people to action. That's the difference between leadership and management. Like, management is often about processes and systems and organization. But leaders have to cast a vision that's clear enough that people can decide if they're on board or not. Biblical leadership is leadership that's guided by the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit provides the vision to the leader. The leader's constantly checking in with, am I in step with the Holy Spirit or not? But there's still that call to cast it over and over and over again because it leaks and motivate people to want to be a part of it and to align the right resources to make sure that it can be executed. I said one last question, but reality, <laughs> I'm a preacher. That's right. Okay, so this is what my students now would ask from yeah. what you just shared. Yeah. How do we practically listen That's right. to the Holy Spirit? 
I tell people you got to stay in the Word. There are so many places where the Bible makes a compelling case for itself as to why people should be in the Word regularly. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Blessed is the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, right? Or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is on the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. What does it say about that man? That man will be like a tree planted by streams of living water. It bears fruit in season. When you think about a tree that's planted by a stream, it's constant nourishment, like all the time. The roots are never dried up. So I think for a leader, it's not too complicated. We tend to overcomplicate it, but that's where that regular rhythm of being in the Word comes in. We're not saying you got to be legalistic and that it's checklist discipleship. We're saying it's like vital, vitally important. How can you lead biblically if you aren't staying connected regularly to that voice of God that comes through God's Word? Amen. Powerful. Powerful. It has been a joy listening to you. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for the invitation.